Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon all of you. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. We begin in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. My name is Marwa Abdullah. I live in San Diego, California, where I work as a community educator, researcher, and college instructor. We are living in the middle of unprecedented times, and in response to some suggestions from my community, I wanted to put together a short talk about how we can help maintain our spiritual and emotional wellness during the COVID-19 crisis, but also during any time that may be challenging or unexpected in our lives. I'd like to start by talking a little bit about what it means to be spiritually or emotionally well, and those are two different uh, concepts. But for many people, when they hear the term spiritual wellness, they think, especially if they're coming from a Muslim tradition, uh, that it means that their faith, their iman, never goes up or down, that it's always you know, very high, and that they never face any challenges related to their faith. Similarly, when people hear the term emotional wellness, they often assume that emotional wellness simply means being happy all the time. And both of those assumptions are actually not correct. Spiritual wellness does not necessarily mean that our faith doesn't increase and decrease or that we don't face challenges associated with our Iman or our uh, spiritual um, state. Emotional wellness, similarly, does not mean that we are happy all the time. Studies actually show that people who expect to be happy all the time are less happy than people who are realistic about their human condition and the fact that emotional levels, happiness and sadness are, are to ex be experienced uh, throughout life and that some days we feel really you know, joyful and elated and other days we may face disappointment um, or sadness. So spiritual and emotional wellness don't necessarily mean that our spiritual and emotional states are always high but they do mean that we are able to assess the situation that we are in, understand what's going on, and take steps to help ourselves manage that situation most effectively. Now that was really abstract, and so I'm going to break things down a little bit and discuss how we can be more spiritually and emotionally well. I'm a practicing Muslim, and so um, having studied Islam and Quran for several years, I'll be speaking from that position and from that perspective. But much of the advice that I'm giving today can be applicable across faith traditions um, in, in you know, people's lives who may not necessarily ascribe to a particular faith as well. So I've done this activity many times, and I like to do this activity with diverse audiences, and I found that no matter what the audience, the outcome is often the same. I ask people to draw a curve of their emotional sort of life. If they think about you know, a certain amount of time, for instance, the past 10 years or the past 15 years, when I work with elementary school students, I often tell them, you know, start from kindergarten and draw a curve that represents your level of happiness. Uh, where the bottom most parts of the curve represent those times when you face difficulties or challenges, when you weren't very happy. And the highest peaks of the curve represent those times when you felt like things were really going your way and you were very, very happy. Now, you can probably guess that nobody that I've asked to do this has a straight line. Um, I, I have a little bit of a background in medicine and a flat line on an EKG machine is generally a sign that someone is not doing very well, right? It's a sign on a heart monitor that they have no heartbeat, that they are no longer alive. Similarly, our spiritual and emotional states do fluctuate, and it's just a normal part of the human condition. It's a part of life. So I'm just going to draw what someone might draw if they were to talk about their emotional state for the past few years, for the past few months, um, it, it may be really whatever time frame that person chooses, our, our state goes up and down. So if that, if, uh, if that is the reality of the human condition, what does it mean to be emotionally well? 
Well, it means that when we face these troughs, these low points, these points of uncertainty, that we're able to recognize them, we're able to acknowledge our emotions, and that we are also able to meet that adversity or that challenge in the best way possible uh, and come out of that adversity or challenge with, with some level of um, emotional integrity. So we're able to get through that challenge. We are able to uh, you know, come out of a stressful situation, adapt to a stressful situation, um, and still maintain uh, a good emotional and psychological state. When I talk about this, I often talk about the tools that we would use to keep ourselves emotionally well, but that leaves out the spiritual wellness. And the spiritual wellness I like to represent with this little heart. And like I said, your spiritual state may go up and down. Right? There may be ups and downs in your spiritual state, but the stronger your connection to, you know, in Islam, the heart is the, the means by which we understand uh, our faith. It's the, the vessel that holds our faith, the vessel that holds our Iman. And it is also a means of spiritual perception. The Quran talks about how people are not blinded at the level of their eyesight, but rather are blinded at the level of their heart, hearts. So it's a means of perceiving truth from falsehood, that which is good and that which is not good, um, in terms of our spiritual well-being and what is good for us in this life and in the hereafter. So the, the heart, if it's the vessel by which we ho that holds our faith, it, it is at its healthiest point when it is connected to its spiritual um, source, so when it's connected to God. And I like to represent that with these sort of cords of connection. And when we strengthen those cords of connection, our emotional state may go up and down, but our spiritual state is more likely to have an even sort of keel to it because those strings of connection, those ties that keep our heart afloat, um, allow us to sort of see the big picture. So even as our emotions fluctuate, there's a, there's a prophetic narration where Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, faced you know, very trying times, very difficult and sorrow-filled times. And one of those moments was when he lost his son and his, his, he was crying. You know, emotionally, he was perhaps at a low point, but he said that um, he would not say anything that was not pleasing to God. His actions were still very much those of someone whose spiritual state um, was balanced. And it is because he had cultivated that connection between his heart and his creator that he was able to ride those waves um, of the emotional ups and downs and still be able to maintain a spiritual uh, sense of well-being. And I think that's really the important kind of connection that I'd like to make in this talk today, that yes, our emotional states go up and down. Yes, we have our highs and our lows, and even our faith, even our Iman goes up and down. But when we cultivate those bonds between our spiritual heart and our creator, when we strengthen those spiritual bonds and ties, we are able to better withstand the highs and lows that are a normal part of the human condition. I've given this talk in a few different forms, and one of the areas of research that I often like to present relates to emotional wellness, and in particular, it relates to the concept of resilience. And resilience really, um, it, its definition is the ability to, to face challenge, adversity, stressful situations, um, and still maintain you know, the, that sense that you are okay and, and come out of those stressful situations um, in, a, in a healthy state. So that is resilience. There are a lot of studies of resilience, and one of the things that I really like about studies of resilience is that the researchers conducting those studies will often go to people who have been through very traumatic and difficult experiences, and, and rather than ask them, you know, what went wrong, they'll ask them, what do you think went right? What do you think helped you? 
Why is it that you were able to show such amazing resilience? And then they'll look at participant responses and they'll actually look for patterns. They'll look for themes. They'll code those responses and say, what can we learn from these exemplary individuals who really faced very difficult situations and, and came out okay? What can we learn from them that we can apply to our everyday lives and the challenges that we face? And so researchers in the area of resilience have put together sort of a portfolio of resilience. What is it, what does, what do these people who show amazing resilience have in common? And I'd like to go through a couple of those points today and again, relate them back to some of the spiritual practices that we can partake in that will help us to cultivate that resilience in our own lives. So the first thing that I like to focus on when I talk about this resilience portfolio is the ability to make meaning, um, uh, make sense of what is happening to us. It's often coded or, or called meaning making. In Islam, uh, we have a built-in sort of structure for understanding what happens in our lives. And there are many, many verses in the Quran and many prophetic traditions or ahadith that speak to this. But one of the verses that I like to discuss in this context um, comes from Surah Ashura, and it it says, uh, I'll, I'll read the verse perhaps in Arabic and then translate it in English. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فما أوتيتم من شيء فمتاع الحياة الدنيا وما عند الله خير وأبقى للذين آمنوا وعلى ربهم يتوكلون. So essentially, if we were to translate this verse sort of all at once without unpacking it or getting into the detailed definitions of every word. This verse is telling us, so then whatever you may have been given, um, you have not been given of anything. So it is characterized as the mata' of this life. And what is with God is better. It's better in value. It's better um, in, in quality and quantity. وَأَبْقَى And longer lasting for a certain type of person, for a certain type of people. Those who الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا have faith وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And who have this concept or this characteristic called تَوَكُّل um, عَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ On their Lord, they put their تَوَكُّل often translated as trust. But we'll get into a little bit more nuanced definition as we go through this verse. So what is this verse really telling us? Essentially, this verse is saying that everything we've been given in our life, whether it be in the form of material things, whether it be in the form of experiences, whether it be in the form of um, hardships that we may have faced, people that we may have encountered, relationships that we may have built or broken, everything we've been given is categorized in this verse using a single word, and that word is matea. And the word matea in Arabic is usually translated as enjoyment or as something that you that you use for, for, for a certain purpose. But the word matea actually has a much sort of deeper meaning and, and deeper connotations than that if you look linguistically at the Arabic language. And so prior to Islam, if you look at the way the Arabs used uh, the word matea, when a when they were if they were making wine and the wine was said to mature, it was said to have reached its matea. Now the consumption of alcohol is something that Muslims are told not to partake in, and so it is something that is considered haram in Islam. Again, this is prior to Islam, so a wine that had reached its mat its maturity was said to have reached its matea. Um, when they would make a rope, they didn't just go to Home Depot and buy a rope. They would actually coil fibers together to make the rope. And when the rope was twisted together and was strong enough to be put to use, it was said to have also reached its mata, so it is ready to be put to use. And when a person had developed their character, had become refined enough so that they could go out in society 
and you know join the world and make a difference in their community that person was also said to have reached their matea so from those connotations and from those usages of the word matea we get sort of the following that when something reaches matea it is something that has reached its utmost maturity it is something that is ready to be put to use and it is something that can be of benefit to to the person and to the community if you look at this in the context of challenges in life in particular we could talk about the challenge that we are all facing with this covid-19 pandemic but we could extend that really to any challenge trial or tribulation challenges are not meant to destroy us they're not meant to bring us down um, or obliterate our psyche or our emotions they're actually help helpful to us in certain ways because they allow us to mature they allow us to hone or build certain skills that we may not have been able to access had we always been on the easy road so our experiences help us to mature um, our experiences are also things that we should draw on to seek benefit from. So kind of like the rope, you know, you don't coil fibers for, for hours and hours until you have this strong and steady rope and then just toss it under the bed and say, well, I'm never going to need that or use it again. Our experiences are not supposed to be swept under the rug. There may be some of us going through this pandemic and saying, I can't wait until this is over. I want to put this behind me. It's been so stressful. I don't ever want to think about it again. But we would really be kind of not taking advantage, perhaps, of the ways in which we can use this time and the lessons that we draw from this time in our future um, experiences and in our future days and in our life. Um, and, and likewise, when we look at um, the way that those experiences shape us, rather than just dismiss them, we should find a way to put them to use. It may be that we learn something during this time that is of a special benefit to someone else who may be going through a difficult time further down the road. And so if we can find ways to use whatever we've learned, to use even the difficult and bitter moments of this pandemic, um, perhaps the, the hardship or the loss that we face, we can use those to benefit other people. None of us is an island, right, by themselves and, and not connected to other people, even with social distancing, even with this lack of physical connection. We can find ways to connect with people and to share our experiences and to help one another learn and journey through this. So that's not the whole verse, right? The verse says that everything you've been given is this matea. It's meant to help you mature. It's meant to be put to use. It's meant to be a benefit to you and to others. And then the verse goes on and says, even so, مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ What is with God even if you look at all of the things you've been given in life and all of the ways your experiences have shaped you and all of the things you've learned and all of the good you've been able to do, what is with God is better and longer lasting for those who have faith and have this concept called tawakkul. So what is it that is with God? There's a lot of ways of understanding that, but one of the ways that I like to explain based on the tafsir or the exegesis of the Quran is that what is with God here is referring to the fact that God understands when we're going through challenging situations. God knows how much we might be striving and struggling and working to, to, to let those experiences help us mature, to put the lessons that we've learned to good use and to use those lessons to be of benefit to other people someone may not notice people might look at someone and think they've never faced a challenging day or a challenging time they may think that oh well they're just they're they're able to give of themselves because they've never gone through a hardship if that's the perception that people have whether it's true or false doesn't really matter because god knows and god rewards us allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us for our intention rewards us for the struggle that we may go through even if some nobody else sees it rewards us 
for the difficulty, for the challenge, for, for overcoming doubts and desires, for overcoming, you know, the temptation to just put it all to the side and, and you know, forget about it and watch Netflix all day or whatever it is, rather than possibly working on ourselves and, and trying to, to be of benefit to ourselves and others. I understand we might need to watch Netflix every once in a while, but the concept or the, the issue is that what is with God is greater because God knows the full dimension of our experiences. And nobody else knows that. Sometimes we don't even know that. But God knows that. And the reward with God thus is greater than anything we can reap in this dunya, than anything that we can harvest of, of material value, of experiences, of accomplishment, of recognition. What is with God is better. And what is with God is often also a reference to Jannah. It is often a reference to the reward um, of the hereafter. And, and that is something that, you know, we can sort of speak to, you know, without, without a doubt, because many of us from the Islamic tradition especially have this very firm conviction that, that Jannah is far greater than anything we can experience in dunya. Um, but even if we were to look at it just from the concept of, of God being aware of all of those dimensions that we may not even be aware of when we go through a challenging time and that he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, rewards us for those things, for those challenges, for, for overcoming fear, uh, for offering a hand, even when it's difficult for us. So what is with Allah, what is with God is greater. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ it is better. It is more khair. Wa'abqa, um, and longer lasting. It's not ephemeral, right? Uh, the, the, feeling, the feeling that we have of overcoming a challenge, um, the, the satisfaction that we have of perhaps using, uh, you know, a difficult time in our lives to benefit others, that's going to make us feel good for a little bit. But it's ephemeral. It's very temporal. Um, it is not something that we will necessarily feel at the same level for every moment of our lives. But the reward that we get with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forever. It is longer lasting. It is abqa. It is enduring. Lilladina um, amanu, for those again who have faith, who can look at the ups and downs of their life, who can look at the trials and the tribulations, understand that this is part of the mata'a and still cultivate in their hearts, in the container of Iman, keep that container replenished by working on their spiritual wellness, by working on their connection to God so that their heart remains attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and better able to withstand the roller coaster that is really a normal part of the human condition. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ What is with Allah is better for those who have Iman and also have tawakkul on, on their Lord. And tawakkul is an amazing word. It's a very interesting concept. It's often translated as trust and who put their trust in their Lord, but it's not really trust. Tawakkul comes from the same word as wakil. And a wakil, if we were to, you know, bring it down to a very practical level, it would be kind of like uh, giving power of attorney to someone. That would be your, how you give, you, how you have your wakil would be someone to whom you've given power of attorney. So it is someone that you have completely entrusted with all of your affairs. You know that this person is going to look out for you, look out for your best interests, even if you don't always uh, see them yourself. So at the, at the level of, of an interpersonal relationship, uh, giving someone power of attorney would be similar to, to you know, um, designating them as your wakil. At the level of the relationship between the abd, between the, the servant of God and God, the idea of tawakkul means that we have this full confidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the disposer of our affairs, that he subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything, that he is beyond 
time. So um, time is, is his creation. So he knows our past, our present, our future, and understands how we need to be in this world and, and provides for us the circumstances to be in this world so that we may achieve our, our fullest potential. Um, and so anything that we come, anything that comes to us, anything that we confront in our lives is seen through that lens, that he is um, our wakil, wanam al wakil, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the disposer of our affairs, is the one in whom we place our trust. And, and we also realize that we have that full responsibility to, to make choices in our life and to act according to his guidance. Um, so we can't just say, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, we have tawakkul on Allah, so he takes care of everything and we don't have to do anything. That, that actually isn't the concept of tawakkul at all. Tawakkul is a, is a, is a ibadah of the heart, but it also is accompanied by um, a ibadah of the limbs, where we do our part, we do everything we can. We take all of the necessary steps, whether they be precautionary or reactionary, we do everything in our control, fully knowing and acknowledging that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate disposer of our affairs and that He subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will give us what is best for us in this dunya and in the hereafter. So that is the, the sort of the structure that I like to present when it comes to how we make meaning of challenges, of trials, and of tribulations. And that's really just one part of that resilience portfolio that I discussed at the beginning of this talk. So what are the other parts of the resilience portfolio? What are the other things that researchers who study resilience have told us help people in the face of challenges, trials, and tribulations, and help them show resilience? The other one is actually very interesting. It's called self-regulation. And it is the ability to, um, to control one's desires and urges, to not act impulsively, uh, and to have a system in one's life for taking care of oneself, uh, both at the physical level and the emotional level. So you have a sort of a routine in your life. It's called self-regulation. And when I read that, I thought it was very fascinating because if I were to explain Islam to someone, I would probably talk a lot about how Islam creates a holistic way of life that is very structured for the, for the person. Um, it, it structures and revolves around making sure that that person is connected to God through sort of a routine uh, reminder of one's gratitude to God and, and one's reliance on God. And so we have in Islam five daily prayers that are meant to be sort of a break from our everyday activities and a chance to pivot toward God and, and say, you know, thank you, God, for what you've given me. And that in and of itself is a type of self-regulation, we could say. But again, built into Islam are these other spiritual practices that are meant to have a material effect in our lives. And one of those is fasting. And fasting has been prescribed in the Quran. The prescription of fasting is talked about as a means of attaining taqwa. And taqwa is this, this amazing consciousness or mindfulness that we are, uh, you know, that we are here for a reason and that we, um, you know, have rights and responsibilities in our lives that need to be recognized and upheld and that we need to act in our life in a way that is pleasing to our creator, um, not just, you know, heedlessly or without thinking, but, but that we are conscious and mindful. That is the, the concept behind taqwa. So fasting is a means of promoting that self-regulation and that ability to control one's impulses and, and not just act you know, impulsively because we want something, um, but rather to think about it and think about how it fits within the frame of our purpose in life. Uh, the third portfolio, I guess the third characteristic in this, res in this resilience portfolio has to do with healthy thinking. And I think this, again, is very fascinating. And I find that it's very, very much rooted also in Islamic uh, teachings and practices. Healthy thinking means that, again, it doesn't mean that we always have happy thoughts, uh, but it means that we're able to recognize how our thoughts influence us. Um, I was listening to a, a great lecture on, uh, on, actually on depression and anxiety. And the, the lecturer was saying that 
every feeling that we have is accompanied or preceded by a thought. We can never say, oh, well, I was just feeling, I wasn't thinking. That, that doesn't actually make sense at the level of our psychology. Our feelings are preceded by thoughts. And so if we have a feeling that we want to manage better or control better, we should take a step back and see what is the thought preceding that feeling. So a really good example of this would be um, if I feel angry. So if I feel angry, anger is the result of perceived attack or insult. If you look at everything that might possibly make someone angry, you realize that it is the perception of an attack or an insult. And if I am angry, I need to go back to the thought that made me angry, that perceived attack or insult, and, and I need to evaluate it. Is it based on something that really happened? Or could it really just be that I perceived this, but it wasn't really what happened in reality, that it wasn't intentional perhaps? And so if I find that I'm angry a lot, one of the steps to healthy thinking would be to take a step back and cognitively understand what are the thought processes that are leading me to be angry. I'm in control of those thoughts. Thoughts are kind of like visitors, right? They knock on the door, uh, but we don't have to let them in and entertain them. We could actually say, you know, I'd prefer that you come back another time or, you know, please, no soliciting. I don't want you to knock on the door anymore. Um, and that, that is the same for a lot of the kinds of negative, quote unquote, negative emotions that we have. Many of them are based more on perception than they are on reality. And we have to acknowledge and realize the, um, the, the degree to which our thinking affects our feeling and our emotional wellness. And then um, the last piece of this resilience portfolio after healthy thinking is something that we all have to strive very hard for, and that is social connectedness. Uh, it is social support. Um, and in other words, it's really feeling like we have a network of people with whom we can connect and who care about us and about whom we care about. And so it th that can be very challenging. In our world today, uh, systems of social support are not as strong as they used to be in decades past. And as uh, we have become more and more industrialized and we've moved away from families and, and work and school have pulled people in so many different directions and really to the farthest corners of the globe, uh, we may find that the, the sort of normal structures of support that people used to rely on long ago, so family and neighbors and community, um, those tend to dissolve a little bit as we move around. And during a pandemic such as the one we are experiencing, it becomes even more difficult to maintain those systems of social support and interpersonal connectedness. But our level of social support has such a huge influence on our emotional wellness. And from an Islamic perspective, it has a huge influence on our spiritual wellness as well. Uh, Islam you know, Islamic teachings advocate the coming together of community, uh, the praying, uh, people, you know, pray in congregation, right? not just because um, uh, for the prayer's sake, but because it, it brings people together. It, it allows for a human interaction uh, and a chance to, to feel supported in one's identity and in one's religious practice. Um, there are so many things that I could point to in the Islamic tradition and in Islamic teachings that emphasize the importance of brotherhood and sisterhood, of family, of community, uh, of neighbors. Uh, it, the list really is endless. And so that, that again, that, um, that social support uh, quality of the resilience portfolio is again something that I feel is very much built in to the Islamic tradition. And so I like to share that, that resilience portfolio. I like to share how it connects to the teachings and practices uh, of Islam. And again, these are things that are prevalent in other traditions as well, but I'm speaking from the positionality of a Muslim and from the positionality of someone who is very much engaged in that spiritual practice and sees the connection between one's spiritual wellness and emotional wellness. So I hope that this has been of benefit um, I have enjoyed giving this talk in different forms, and usually I have an audience uh, 
in front of me with whom to interact and it's, it's very different and I have to acknowledge that it's actually very difficult to be speaking just to a screen and I miss seeing people and I miss my community members and I miss my friends as I'm sure the viewers of this video can attest. Um, I'm sure all of you have people in your lives that you miss and it's my prayer and my, my hope that we are able to come out of this challenging time um, and show resilience in the face of many of the difficulties that we are facing, but also show gratitude for whatever is, is, is you know, easy for us at this time. Uh, the Quran is very uh, specific about hardship and tells us inna ma'al usri yusra, that verily with every hardship comes ease. So they are kind of like puzzle pieces that fit together. There's always going to be challenges in our lives, but there will always be um, something that helps us get through those challenges. And so I, I hope that we are able to tap into that ease and share it with others and support one another. Uh, thank you for watching and um, may the peace and blessings of God be upon all of you. And I pray to see community members in person again soon. Assalamu alaikum.